It is such an honor to be here with the Gideons from all over the world and all of our Texas pastors. I love Texas pastors because that's right. Church is always bigger and better in Texas. I get that. Amen. And there's always great expectations in the Texas churches. I heard a story about when Billy Graham came here and went to the old Cowboys Stadium and on the way to the airport after he had had an incredible crusade, he looked at the limo driver and he said, I've always wanted to drive one of these. Do you think I could just kind of slip behind the wheel? And the guy really didn't want to do it, but it was Billy Graham, what do you say? And so they switched places. And Billy got a little out of control and got up to about 90 miles an hour. And so a Texas state trooper hauled Billy over and he walked up to the driver's side and Billy rolled the window down and he saw who it was and he panicked. And so he went back to his squad car and he, he called up to the police station. He said, chief, we got big problems. He said, well, what's wrong? He said, I pulled over somebody big. He said, well, who is it? Did you pull over the governor? No, much bigger than the governor. He said, well, I don't think the president's in town. No, chief, much bigger, much bigger than the president. He said, well, who is it? He said, chief, I'm not sure. But Billy Graham is the chauffeur, so I think I pulled over Jesus. <laughs> Great expectations in Texas. But I will tell you, we have great expectations about what the Lord Jesus has done all over the world to be in Gideon Bibles. And I am certainly fruit of that. I grew up in a very dark home. My dad was 100% Jewish. I've taken the DNA test. He was 100%. And he never even told us until years later. My mom grew up in a cult. My grandfather was a cult leader. And so there were no Bibles in my home. I never heard that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Now, I did hear he rose from the dead, but that was a bit fuzzy. And so when I was five years old, my parents were divorced. And because they paid women poorly and my dad cut our alimony when he traveled to Hawaii, things were very difficult for us. And so I remember times when there was no food to eat in the house and my mom was too proud to go to the food bank. And, and so there were days when I just didn't eat anything. And, and I was the most emaciated kid always in my school. And it was kind of embarrassing growing up that way. And I'll never forget when I was in fourth grade and people made fun of me and my friends laughed at me and because I was, I was so thin and so emaciated. And I'll never forget, I went to a, a YMCA camp out and a Gideon showed up. And he was handing out Gideon Bibles. And I was absolutely fascinated. There was no Bible in my home. I had never read a Bible. And so he began to share his, his word to us and handed out the Bibles. I was absolutely thrilled. And that Gideon, who loved an emaciated kid from Mobile, Alabama, reached out to me and gave me a copy of the Scriptures. Well, I certainly couldn't tell my family that I was reading the Bible. They would have made fun of me. They would have mocked me. And so I secretly began to read my Gideon Bible. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell a friend. I didn't tell my family. But every day I read something out of that Bible. Didn't understand it, but I read it. Then a couple of years later, we went on vacation to New Orleans. And when we got to New Orleans, I'd always heard that there was more to the Bible. And I was a typical sixth grader and I was opening drawers and checking everything and I opened the drawer and there was the rest of the Bible and it was placed by Gideon's and in my mind taking that Bible would have been stealing the Bible and I thought to myself it I, I can't steal a Bible I mean you just can't do it but to my everlasting shame I did steal that Bible <laughs> And in my mind, that's what I had done. And, and it was confirmed by my friends. They, they thought I'd stolen the Bible too when they found it in my room or whatever. And, and so, so I, I had the whole Bible. And I began to read the Old Testament and that was more confusing than the New Testament. So when I was in ninth grade, I was in a group called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. My friend Jeff Frost is here tonight. He and I went to high school together and he actually had gone to that Bible study with me. It was a guy named Ray Bark who taught it. And 
the first time I went, I, I, my friends on the football team said, come to a Bible study. I had no idea what a Bible study was. I didn't even go to church at that time. But I'll never forget listening to the story of Ray Bark, where he explained that I was a sinner and that my good works could not get me to heaven and that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He loved me so much. I had never heard that. I thought that Jesus dying on the cross was some big homicide that had no purpose. But I heard that night that Jesus died for my sins and there was a purpose. And so that night I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he forgave me, he cleansed me. I was so happy. I was so full of scripture. I didn't even wait for the invitation. I just believed right when I heard it. They asked you to raise your hand if you prayed a prayer. I didn't pray the prayer. I was already saved by the time the prayer came. I was so full of the Word of God. And so here I am, a born-again Christian. And I started going to church. And my parents had always warned me about going to Baptist churches. And they said, son, whatever you do, don't ever go to a Baptist church. <laughs> and here I am going to a Baptist church, carrying my little Gideon Bible. Well, a couple of years went by. I did struggle in my faith. But I decided I was going to sell out to Jesus. And so I came up with a plan where I was going to go out with my friends, and Jeff remembers this well, and I would take a friend out every morning, a friend out at lunch, different friend on the football team every day, and we would share Jesus with people during lunch and in the morning. And then we started a Bible study. And I took my Gideon Bible to school, and every day of the week I taught a Bible study at school. And I'm, and I'm studying the Word of God with my friends, and we packed out the room. That's why we had to do it five days a week. And I'm, I'm teaching out of my Gideon Bible. And, and, and there was a revival that broke out on our football team. And then when I would share and speak to the team, I would speak out of that Gideon Bible. Jeff and I played defensive line right next to one another. He had accepted Jesus. And when we tackled people, we would always say, praise the Lord. <laughs> and we would, we would tell them about Jesus. And they printed our testimonies. And they, they, we, had, we had them give them out in the stands. And... And it was a great opportunity for us to have a platform to share Jesus Christ. Well, I will tell you, now I am a pastor, and the Gideons still bless my life. My best friends in my church are Gideons. I have a church full of Gideons. By the grace of God, we support two Gideon camps. And, and now we're doing conversations. And I want to urge you, pastors, you know, we do faith evangelism, yeah. And we do faith evangelism. I was a faith evangelism trainer. I love pastors. I've trained hundreds of them in that, and we still do it. But we've, we've trained the most people, they tell us, in California, and we've had four trainings already, more on the way. And since January 1st, and I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, the most unchurched area in the country, and I will tell you, since that time, we have baptized more people this year than ever before in the history in our church, and we're just halfway through. And we've added more people. I had, I had 26 people in my new members class this past Sunday. We've got seven people coming forward this Sunday, three by profession of faith. My people have just gone berserk. They're out of control. I don't know what to do with them anymore. But God has blessed us. I, I think about Ara. Ara, many of you know him, one of the Gideon guys at the headquarters, dear friend, and he came and spoke at my church, and we'd already, we already supported two camps, and, and, the, and they said, would you like to take up a third offering? And I said, absolutely, but we were really having a tough time. It was pandemic last year, as you know, and our, our offerings were down dramatically at that time. But you know what? Gideons are our priority. And so we, we, had, the, we had the talk, and, and I don't know what happened. I don't even know why it happened. Maybe we had the priorities right. But the windows of heaven opened up, and we took in more money for our budget last year than in the history of the church, because I think we took a step of faith, and we made the main thing the main thing. We supported, in my mind, the greatest evangelistic ministry in the entire world, our Gideons. And pastors, I want you to know, I want you to know, I love pastors. I, I suffer the same loneliness at times, the hardships, the challenges of the pandemic have been unbelievable. 
And I want you to know tonight, it's such an honor and a joy to be with all of you, my fellow Gideons. Love you guys. Thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony with you tonight.